V.S. Ramachandran from Madras um, is professor at uh, UCSD, uh, director of the Center for Brain and Cognition, former BBC Wreath lecturer, um, numerous awards from the Royal Institution. He's co-authored some wonderful books, including Phantoms in the Brain. Uh, he authored a Brief Tour of Human Consciousness and is about to regale us. V.S. Ramachandran. Thank you, Roger. You can show that after my talk tomorrow. Oh, all right. You mean this? This, yeah. <laughs> um, well, I'm delighted to be here. I would like to begin by, of course, thanking Roger Bingham, the Zepp family, for putting this wonderful conference together. You've heard some really interesting talks this morning. Uh, I'm not going to talk about religion and science, however interesting that topic might be. Instead, I'd like to talk about C.P. Snow's two cultures, humanities and science, and remember he said, never the twain shall meet. I'm going to argue that, in fact, the human brain provides the interface between the two cultures. And in a sense, this is what we do in our lab. We look at patients who have had uh, a small change in the brain, either a damage to the brain or a genetic change in the brain, producing characteristic changes in their mind, in their behavior, and then ask ourselves, what can you learn about the normal human mind, human nature, by studying these patients? And I'm going to focus on a specific example of this, uh, a phenomenon called synesthesia, which is originally described uh, by Francis Galton, who is a cousin of Charles Darwin. And um, I'm going to start with this little quirky phenomenon and take you all the way. In fact, the original title of my talk was from mo uh, synesthesia from molecules to metaphor. So we're going to start with this little quirk and take you on a journey all the way to metaphor and Shakespeare and creativity. Um, hopefully without too many bumps along the way. Okay, what's synesthesia? Well, it goes back to Galton, as I said, and he noticed that certain individuals in the population who are otherwise completely normal had the following quirk, and that is every time they see a particular number, it would be colored. So, for example, five would be red, six would be green, seven would be blue, eight would be indigo, so on and so forth. Or given tones might be colored. C sharp might be blue, F sharp might be green, so on and so forth. Now, what causes this phenomenon? Galton pointed out it runs in families. And since that time, uh, so he said there may be a genetic basis. Since that time, we've also known one of the peculiar aspects of synesthesia is that it's about eight times more common among artists, poets, novelists, and other creative types than in all of us less, less gifted people. And the question is, why does this happen? And this takes us into many interesting aspects of human nature, like creativity and metaphor and all of that which I'll get to later in the talk. So there have been several standard theories of synesthesia floating around. One view is, well, they're just crazy. What do you mean five is red or C sharp is blue? And this, of course, is common in science. If something doesn't make any sense, you brush it under the carpet. It's called an anomaly. It doesn't make any sense, so you engage in denial, something that a lot of my colleagues are very prone to. Um, now, that doesn't get you very far saying that synesthetes are crazy. Uh, the second argument is that they are remembering memories from early childhood. So maybe this chap was playing with refrigerator magnets and five was red, six was blue, seven was green, and for some reason he stuck with these memories into adulthood. This never appealed to me very much because if it's true, then why does it run in families? You'll have to say the same magnets were being passed down from generation to generation, <laughs> which might be true, but it didn't make any sense to me. The third argument is, well, maybe these people are just being metaphorical when they say F-sharp is green or whatever. And um, just as we say we have synesthetic metaphors, we say cheese is sharp, cheddar cheese. Well, cheese isn't sharp. You rub it on your skin. It's soft. So why do you say it's sharp? Well, you say, well, it's a metaphor. But that's circular. Why do you use a tactile metaphor to describe a gustatory sensation? These are called cross-sensory metaphors. So in a sense, saying that synesthesia is just a metaphor doesn't explain a damn thing. You're trying to explain one mystery with another mystery, which, as Pat Churchill would tell you, never works in science. So saying synesthesia is just a metaphor, OK, what is a metaphor? We don't have the foggiest idea, part of the metaphor, right? So we don't know what the neural instantiation is in the brain. So what I'm going to do is turn it upside down and argue that synesthesia is a concrete sensory phenomenon whose neural basis you can pin down in the brain. I'm going to show you the evidence for that. And that, in turn, will give you an experimental lever an experimental foothold, metaphors, for understanding uh, things like elusive aspects of the mind, like metaphor and creativity. Uh, and 
a, that's a long journey. So we're going to start with this quirky phenomenon. So the first thing we need to do is to show that, uh, sorry, this is an old lecture, um, uh, is to show that synesthesia is a real phenomenon. These people are not crazy. And I'm also going to show that this is a sensory phenomenon, not some high-level memory association or metaphor. We're going to ask what are the precise brain mechanisms that give rise to synesthesia, and then who cares? Uh, why is this important for understanding human nature? So let's go through that. And I said it runs in families. It's more common among artists, poets, and novelists, so on and so forth. Okay, how do you show it's a real phenomenon? First of all, we found it's much more common in, in, in the general population than people believe. People used to think it's one in 10,000 or one in 1,000. We found it's about one in 200, and more recent estimates are like one in 30 or 40 people have synesthesia. So there's probably one or two of you here who are sort of ashamed to admit it. Okay, so first of all, it's very common. We found two students at UCSD, and they were seeing fives as red and two as green, for example. So we created this computer display composed of a number of um, twos, or sorry, rather fives. Embedded in that is a bunch of twos. It's hard to find them. There's one there, one there, one there, okay? So a normal person looking at this, to find the embedded twos, like in your Ishihara test for traffic uh, driving licenses. Here you've got an embedded shape, like a square or a triangle or a circle. And then a normal person takes 20 seconds, 30 seconds, 40 seconds. A synesthete immediately sees this and says, oh, I see a red upside down triangle. And he sees it much more quickly, right? And he says, I see it pop out from the background. So if he's crazy, how come he's better at it than all of us, OK? So this shows that you're dealing with A, a genuine phenomenon, and B, a sensory phenomenon, because he says the color pops out. I can see it, literally see a triangle against a background of green uh, fives in this case. Now, the other thing we found, which further confirms this, if you take a, a number that produces a color red, say, to show it to a synesthete, and then simply lower the contrast of the number, so it's gray on black instead of white on black, as you reduce the contrast, the saturation of the color drops progressively, monotonically. And, and in fact, by the time you get to about 10% contrast, you can still see the number, but the color disappears. So if it's some high-level memory association and cognitive phenomenon, why should, you, why should it show any dependence on contrast? This shows it's an early sensory process. And there's more evidence for that, which I'll get to in a minute. OK. Next, what's going on in the brain? Where does it occur? So Ed Hubbard, who's a graduate student in my lab, and I were looking at brain atlases. And that's the temporal lobes. And that's the fusiform gyrus uh, in the temporal lobe. And it turns out that Semir Zeki's color area, which processes color in the brain, is there in the fusiform gyrus. It's called V4. We were struck by the fact that the number area in the brain, which is discovered by uh, Stanislaus Dehain and also Tim Rickard in our center, uh, lie right next to each other, almost touching each other in the fusiform gyrus. Now, we said, what's the likelihood that the most common type of synesthesia is number to color, and these two areas are touching each other in the brain? It's, what's going on here is there is some kind of sloppy wiring in some people. So these two areas, instead of remaining completely segregated, there's some cross wiring, uh, which causes every time you see a number, it activates not only a number neuron, but cross activates a color neuron. So you see a color every time you see a number. Now the question is, uh, why would this occur? Why would cross activation occur in some people? So remember, the clue comes from the fact that Galton's original claim that it runs in families and there may be a genetic basis. So our idea was that in the, in the fetus, in an early infancy, everything is connected to everything in the brain, so to speak. And then you prune away the excess connections that develop inhibition to create the characteristic modular architecture of the adult brain. Okay? And if there is a mutation in this pruning gene, which obviously will be passed down across generations, then you get defective pruning across adjacent brain regions. And if, because of transcription factors, that defective gene is expressed selectively in the fusiform gyrus, then you get a number color synesthete. So far, so good. Is there any other evidence for this idea that it's an early sensory process? 